So we starting another ruling which concurs with the view of Rav Yochanan. Okay, and um, if you remember, Rami Bahama taught in Abraisa that there are four custodians and they require partial denial and partial admission in order to become liable to the custodian's oath prescribed in the Torah. Now, Gavin, what are the four custodians? Ah, what a bad day to get me. All right. Um, there's always, it's always. Is, the, is there's the paid, there's the unpaid. I'm excellent. not going to do it in order. There's no order. But there's more. No. Oh, there's no order. Good. Okay. Paid, unpaid. Um, then there's, well, those are the two obvious ones. Yeah. What are the other two? Okay. Uh, Arthur. Well, according, according lifeline. Yeah, there we go. There is a lifeline. I'll take that. <laughs> okay. Arthur. Okay. Now, I'm, I know you're waving to me. Uh, we're not going in a bus. I'm not seeing you off. I'm asking you a question. You've got the paid custodian mm -hmm. and the unpaid custodian. It's amazing. Can <laughs> you ask me the question? Can you ask me the question again? What are the four custodians? Gavin said the paid custodian and the unpaid custodian. And the two others, as you remember, are. I, I did the two yeah. hard ones. You did the two easier ones. He did the easy ones. Yeah, I did the, yeah, did no, the, I did the two ones. hard ones. All right, really guys, come. Um, then there's the, the borrower. Excellent. Yeah. And um, what's the other one? It's the borrower and okay, I don't know what the fourth one is that. I'm thinking favor, but it's not the right word. All right. If you go um, to hire a tool, what do you, do you become then? In other words, you go to hire at a scaffolding at the Springbok hire. You become then a renter. I, I don't know how to I don't know what it is. I just don't know how to, what's the terminology. So it's it's think, like I think the term, renter. Why? Because it's the renter. That's the word. Even the renter. Yeah. Exactly. It's the renter. Why? Because many people, they don't want to have a capital outlay of using a tool permanently when it's a once-off until the usage of it supersedes the rental on a regular basis. Okay? So, we know that there are different obligations regarding a uh, the different custodians. And what is the general rule, guys? Arthur, what's the general rule? It's questioning the drums come. Okay. I'm just going to try and get a bit of a light better, Brendan, because it's behind me here. I'm just going to let off. Oh, guys, Brendan's in the shirt. Can you see? That's Brendan. Uh, how's it, Brendan? How's it, guys? Okay, okay. so we're not excluding. I'm just going to get a light. Very good. Then. Just relax there. Sorry, we're not excluding. Brendan. We just, I just want to get a, without this thing bouncing off. Sorry, man. All right, guys, let me put you out of your misery because Arthur's done a duck. Uh, convenient. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. So, Arthur, what's the, what is the overall rule regarding liability for uh, the four different children, the four different custodians? <laughs> Lucky it's not a complicated thing. Okay. So, for the, for the um, unpaid, yeah. Okay. He's not responsible for anything. Uh, because he's doing it as a favor, and unless he does something he's not supposed to, you know I mean, okay, yeah, I, I, I would accept that as a very reasonable answer. And that uh, what Arthur's saying is that if you're doing somebody else a favor, they you're not going to want to do them a favor if you're going to land up in court for each and everything. So, if you're doing them a favor, they kind of got to be a little bit gentle to you, otherwise, you need it like a hole in the head, okay? That's yeah. excellent. And uh, okay, and the paid custodian is responsible for everything, even if it's um, unnatural. Um, even right, we, we're gonna we're gonna see well, we're gonna see, but the like, principle is right. So what Arthur's saying is, when you pay to do a service, your level of responsibility is stepped up because if you're getting a financial benefit, then you have to be liable on a greater level than when somebody's doing you a favor and looking after things for you at no financial benefit. Uh, now, uh, as far as the borrower is concerned, what category does he fall into in terms of responsibility?
Does a borrower? Yeah, so he's somewhere in, in between. He's not. He's no, not paid actually, or Brendan I... got it right. Brendan, Brendan sets full responsibility because you he's you doing him the massive favor. You stand to lose everything when he damages everything, and therefore. Uh, he, you're getting no benefit. You're just doing a chesed for him. So then he has to have much more of a responsibility even than an unpaid custodian because uh, um, at the end of the day, a paid custodian has a level of responsibility to you that's high because they're deriving a benefit. But you're also getting a benefit because you're paying for a service that uh, you deem as having value. Otherwise, you wouldn't spend money on it. With the borrower, you're getting no value in the secular world for it, other than doing somebody a favor. There's no, in other words, if you pay for a service, you see value in that service. Both parties are benefit, okay? And therefore, your level of responsibility is certainly higher than an unpaid custodian, but not as high as a borrower, because uh, you, the borrower, you do a massive favor for, he's a headache for you. In the next world, it's beneficial. In this world, it's a headache. Okay, and therefore he owns the most amount of responsibility. Now, a renter is an interesting one. How do you deem a renter, Gus? It's like 50 50. It's like it, it's um, it's look, if something it. happens to the place that's, that's unnatural, you're not responsible. But if you actually let's say you borrow a tool and it breaks naturally. You're not responsible. But if you borrow a tool and you then go smash it into a wall and you break it to pieces and you abuse it to it, then you're responsible for it. Um okay, we we're gonna go through we're gonna go through that at all. I mean Arthur's got the root idea well, but it's not quite like that. But Arthur was on to a good point, is that we learned that there were two different opinions. There are some opinions that see the uh, renter as a unpaid custodian and some that see the rent as a paid custodian. Why? Anya, anything? I don't forget, uh, if there's anything else beyond that, let's say it gets stolen or you're responsible, that you are responsible for the replacement of it, if, if it gets stolen or something like that. All right, so I'm going to delineate it, and it depends how you see the rent. Damon, you're frozen in time again. Ah, mother flipper. Maybe it's just me. Okay. This is not good for my Tourette's. I would I, I, I would stop the recording. <laughs> not. Can you hear me? Guys, uh, can you hear me? I, I heard the mother flipper. Uh, mother flipper, yeah, you heard right. <laughs> so I'm trying. Just mm -hmm. you guys can load shedding or what? Uh, what do you I can see darkness, I wasn't sure. <laughs> All right, can you hear me now, guys? I've changed the position of the laptop. Yeah. I just want to put tin foil on my head. Give me a sec. All right. Um, <laughs> oh, that's, it's, it's, it's a mystery. All right. So, guys, let, let, uh, let me just explain to you where it is. Let me tell you where the puzzle okay. is once and for all. It's in Schmott, okay. which is Exodus, Brendan, chapter 2, verse 6 to 14. And there, the Torah details three levels of responsibility for damage or loss to an item entrusted to a custodian. So an unpaid custodian is responsible only if the damage or loss results from his negligence. Bear that in mind. When we say damage or loss, we don't mean that, uh, um, that he loses it. It means that something like maybe a sheep came past and took the animal. Do you get what I'm saying? Now, the paid custodian is now over, has a higher level of responsibility, Brendan, because he's responsible even if the article uh, is lost or stolen, because better safeguards might have prevented these occurrences. And since he was paid, he's paid to take uh, more uh, careful procedural measures, right? But as Arthur hinted, uh, we hadn't gotten uh, to a renter yet, but if if, um, if it's a paid custodian and you see the renter as a paid custodian, he's not liable for unavoidable mishaps, such as death of an animal, natural breakage if the animal breaks a leg, or forced seizure. A, a gun is held to his head, the item is taken. 
Now, the borrower is responsible even to the extent of unavoidable accidents, as Arthur said. Okay? In other words, he's exempt from liability only if the article broke as a result of the normal use of which he borrowed it. So say, for example, Brendan, I'm lending you a cop, and suddenly a head gasket goes and blows. I'm not saying if you're an idiot and you see the temperature gauge goes up and you're still driving. And I'm saying bang, the head, or, or something that I've been using it for years and it's on its way out. You borrow it and you're stuck in the engine seizures. That's not your fault, even if you borrowed it. But short of that, if it's hit by lightning, you're responsible. Okay? So, how do you see a, a renter? Now, to ask, this is the source of it. It's a different source. It is it still in Pasuk uh, of, of, of Shmot, Exodus, chapter 22, but it's in it's in the 14th verse, uh, verse. It's in the last verse. So remember, Brendan, 6 to 14, just write that down. In the 14th verse, it states only that he does not have the same liabilities as a, a borrower. So there's a tonight dispute as to his level of liability. Rabbi Yehuda, guys, you should all remember this, equates a renter with a paid custodian, whereas Rabbi Meir equates him with an unpaid custodian. Just remember that. Now, I want to tell you why I understand Rabbi Yehuda. It's not that I don't understand Rabbi Meir. It's that I've got to go back and read Rabbi Meir's reasoning. Is that Rabbi Yehuda is saying, look, if you think of it like a um, paid custodian, a custodian is paid for his services, which means you are paying to rent a, a power drill, for example. Okay, So you see benefit in renting a power drill because you don't want to spend two grand on a power drill. So you want to rent it off one, once off for 180 rand, right? So you, you're paying because you see a benefit. Paying a custodian because he's looking after his, your stuff, you see a benefit, right? But the same token that the custodian has to take a higher level of responsibility. In this case, the person renting the article can't damage it because if it's worth 3,000 rand and for his 180 rand, he doesn't deserve, you don't deserve to have it broken. So you can see there's a, a, a mutually beneficial relationship. That's how Rabbi Yehuda sees it. I need to look up, guys, how Rabbi Man uh, equates it with an unpaid custodian. But it doesn't matter, guys. When a custodian claims that the article entrusted to his care was lost or damaged through an occurrence for which he's not liable, like the unpaid custodian claims that it was stolen, and then the paid custodian claims that the animal died, right? Or the borrower claims that it... Uh, then it broke in the normal course of use. You know, he uh, borrowed uh, uh, um, he he borrowed a drill and it broke. The Torah requires only that he has to take a custodian's oath, asserting his exemption from liability. Just remember that. So the Bryce teaches that the custodian's oath is prescribed for a case when the custodian made a partial admission. In other words, we learned this last uh, last time, guys, on Thursday night. If he denies liability entirely, he's not required to take an oath. And if he did take an oath, he does not have the status of a court-imposed oath, okay, if he denied it uh, uh, emphatically. So in the event that he was an unpaid custodian and he claims, for example, that the deposit was stolen in entirety, and he, and he did a, a, a sort to that effect, Later, it's discovered that with witnesses that he himself stole it, he's not liable to the careful penalty. Uh, um, now, if you want to know why, because we learned with Rav Yochanan, he claims it was stolen, not lost. He is liable uh, uh, to pay it back and the careful penalty. But this is Rami Barhama, who taught in this Brisa, and he disputes Rav Chia by Yosef's assertion that the biblical custodian's oath is imposed even on a custodian who denies the depositor's claim in its entirety. So let me tell you what I'm saying. Rav Chia by Yosef says, every custodian has to take this derisive biblical oath. Whether the custodian admits partial liability or whether he denies the claim in its entirety, he has no choice. Rami Bachama said he only has to take the oath if he partially admits to liability, uh, but not if he fully denies liability. Now, what did we discuss last time, Brendan? We said that if an object, uh, th this makes sense with regards to a loan. Gavin, explain why it makes sense in regards to a loan. A partial admittance that the, uh, we make the person uh, take an oath 
regarding a loan, but not a not a full denial. I can't hear you, Gav. Gav, you on on mute. Put myself on mute. I oh, know. Can you hear me now? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um. So. Arthur, go for it. Kevin, where are you? Come on, you used no, to I'm not, in, I'm not in a good space. So all right, all right, Arthur, Arthur, go Arthur, Arthur, go for it. Why are you picking on me? What did I do? Because Kevin's no, on the bus. Kevin knows where it's coming Kevin always takes the bus when it's question time. No, I've got an idea, <laughs> but I'm, I'm taking it out. Yeah? Let's repeat the question again so I can have it fresh in my head. Kevin's the smartest out of all of you because he takes the bus exactly yeah, when it's question time. Okay, no, I've actually got off the bus. The bus okay, so hang on a second. Let's it's take an advert station. break and let Kevin teach us Torah. Then he's off the hook for questions. Kevin, teach us. Actually, I thought, okay. So, just one thing here. Um, in this week's parasha, or the parasha Pinchas, one of the issues, one of the things discussed is about morality in terms of rivalry. And um, in terms of bribery, even, even if somebody is in this, right? Let me just say, uh, I'm trying I'm to hear you. Just, let me just say what I want to say. I know, but we can't hear you. That's why I'm yes, right. Just let it. Can you hear me now? Yes, and I'm now? saying I wasn't interrupting you. We can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, it's yes. better. I feel like I'm at the audiologist. Okay, okay. So it discusses uh, bribery and morality. So if people are bribed, if officials are bribed or judges, then they're not moral, they won't, not ethical, and they won't give a fair decision to either side. They'll be, they'll be swayed, they'll be biased. And um, even if the person, even if somebody gives a judge $50 and, and says, please judge, just judge this case fairly, even though the judge may, won't judge in the oath's favor, that is still, naturally, human instinct is that people Will feel they have a, they they owe somebody because he gave them fifty dollars. They owe them, and they'll he'll feel he may uh, give a verdict in the favor of that person. So no one is allowed to be swayed. And you and even if someone like Moshe Rabbeinu, the Rav said today, if he took a bribe as a once off, he'd never be able to be aid ever again. And that's the law. That's Jewish law, because uh, bribery and corruption, as we know very well leads to the breakdown of society. Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Well done. But I can hear you now. We couldn't hear you. And you usually give it in the beginning of the show, but you're on the I'm walking, I'm walking to the platforms now. Okay. Yeah. No, okay. Well, I got at the train. It's actually a better option. It's the station. Yeah. So to I'm just to quickly you, add yes, to what you. Kevin yeah. said, it's so serious that say, for example, there's a judge on the base den. Okay. And he's got a per and he met you on Shabbos and you had a lack of Shabbos with a guy and he got to know you, but he doesn't know the other person in the case. And he's already built some sort of emotional connection to you. He has to recuse himself of uh, um, um, listening and, and puskening or uh, a verdict on the case, meaning he cannot judge the case because he's got an unfair bias towards the person, not only that didn't bribe him financially, but one who feels that was the one party as opposed to the other. Does that far, Kev? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, what 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 we are saying, um, Arthur, is as follows: is that um, what's what's this case of the fact that um, we were talking about a partial admission? And a, a, and a partial denial and a full denial with respect to a loan and a custodian. So what did we discuss on Thursday? I can give it over in three sentences. I know the delay strategy, the delay strategy that's all I remember. Of whom? For the, for the, um, uh, the, the, the guy that's, that, that took the loan. Okay. But, but, but the, the guy who owes money or, or who did if, if he did something wrong or stole or whatever, but but partially admitting to it, he's buying time. 
to, to either come up with the balance of the funding or to try to get out of it. Or, Excellent. Or just to, Excellent. So, just, so that, that part I do remember. Excellent. So, Brendan, this is what we're saying, okay? There were different opinions as to... Um, there was a puzzle that we learned in the verse of the custodian, funny enough, that whether a, a custodian, not somebody that lends money, that at the end of the day, uh, there's an issue. Why is there an issue? Because um, there was basically a case where in order to um, be uh, having to be compuls compulsorily by the court forced to adjure a case where you swear as to an issue, the, the courts don't believe you if you didn't, uh, uh, they, they don't believe you if you admit partial liability, but they believe you if you deny it completely, which is actually counterintuitive. Because generally, if somebody admits to saying, listen, I owe you some money, well, you believe them because kind of, in a way, uh, they're willing to pay. So you think, okay, this guy's more honest. He's saying, this is all I owe, but I do owe some money. So he's saying, okay, that's more believable than a guy says, I owe you nothing. Because this pasuk of this is it is saying, yeah, I owe you this, but not that. You know, this is all I owe you. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying is it's not quite as simple as that. Why? Because as far as uh, uh, as far as uh, as far as a loan is concerned, we can understand why a partial admittance is actually a sign of guilt. Because if somebody bails you out of trouble and lends you money, you're going to feel some sort of an obligation to them that you can't look in their face and dead on lie that, in fact, um, you don't owe them anything because they actually try to uh, bail you out of a very difficult situation and they lend you money. So you might not have all the money. So you say, yeah, uh, and you know you borrowed 100 grand. So you'll turn around and say, yeah, uh, I borrowed 50 grand. And the guy's going to say, what the heck? And you made to do an oath that, in fact, you only owe 50 grand. Because you're not going to lie outright and say, I don't owe you anything, because you feel some sort of appreciation for that. But you don't, as Gavin said, have the 100 grand. So you want to kind of buy time and then come up with that other 50 grand. And it says the merciful one wants you to swear because you've got to come clean on everything. If you say you don't have all the money at the time, then make a payment plan or something. Yeah. But you've got to admit to it. But if a person denies it, somebody would not be as brazen as to deny somebody that helped them that they, they say, no, you didn't lend me any money. Nobody's that callous, yeah. at least in those times of the Torah values. So therefore, a complete denial is believed because nobody would be that, uh, have, be that disrespectful. But regarding a deposit that somebody put to your care and you've been, say this person gave you something and he didn't pay you anything, but you have to look after it for two weeks. And at the end of the day, he's trying to sue you for taking it. You're not going to feel that you owe anything. You put two weeks of your life aside to look after this object, and maybe you feel there's a multi-millionaire is not going to miss an ashtray is trying to sue you for. So you'll lie completely. You'll say, I don't know you any. And therefore, a um, uh, a complete denial with regards to a deposit uh, is expected because there's no affinity. The guy didn't bail you out of trouble. If anything, he took advantage, and he didn't pay you. So that's where Gavin's coming from. So Gavin, well done. Do you get what I'm saying, Gav? Well done. Yeah. Damon, can you just repeat that last two minutes because somebody asked me a question here at the station. Just, just please repeat the, what Gavin, uh, uh, what Gavin deduced. Okay. Um, so, so basically, uh, what what we're saying is. Rav Kiyah by Abba said in the name of Rav Yochanan, right? If somebody's an unpaid custodian and claims a claim of theft by thief with respect to a deposit that Kevin had been entrusted to him for safekeeping, he's not liable to the twofold payment unless he denies part of the depositor's claim and admits to part of it. What's the reason? Because it says in the Pasuk, for any matter about which the custodian says, this is it. What does this expression, this is it, mean? It means this is what I owe you and nothing more. Whomever the judge has found guilty shall pay twofold to his fellow. So where's this in Shmuel chapter 22, verse 8? Okay? So it means I only owe you this much, I don't owe you that much. So Rav Chia by Yosef 
said that basically uh, he didn't agree with Rav Yochanan. And the reason being is he said, there's a mixture of scriptural passages written here. Why? Because when it says in the verse, this is it, it refers to partial admission, but it's in, uh, with respect to a loan, not with respect to deposit. Because if one sued for payment for a loan, he feels a certain, according to rubber, he feels a certain affinity to the one who lent him money. So he's not going to deny all the money. Feels bad. So there's a presumption that somebody isn't that brazen enough to deny his obligation to the face of his creditor. God did him a favor. So if he's that brazen that he denies the claim entirely, he's believed without an oath. Because if he actually owed the claimant money, he couldn't have been so chutzpahdik and brazen as to deny it outright. But somebody that says, listen, are you some of it? I don't owe you anything. Is as Gavin said, using it as a delay tactic, a tactic, but it can't be that brazen as to actually deny it in total, because he feels beholden to him. Different with the custodian, uh, uh, in in case of a deposit, because he doesn't owe this guy anything. This guy didn't lend him money. If anything, the guy used him as an unpaid custodian. Is now ending up in court, and he he maybe feels like you know what I should have been paid something. I'm going to keep it. So if he if he denies it completely, according to Rav here by Yosef, he has to actually, um, he actually has to take an uh, an an oath with regards to a uh, deposit with the custodian because uh, he can deny it completely. We don't believe him either way, whether it's a partial admittance or a full admit uh, full denial, he has to take an oath. So Rav Chia by Yosef disputes Rav Yochanan because Rav Yochanan says that a, cus, um, uh, that a custodian uh, that um, ad admits, ad admits to uh, part of it and denies part of it, only on that basis we make him take an oath. Do you get the two opinions? So how does it relate to what we're dealing with here? We're talking about the four custodians, and we're saying we know one another source now for Rami Bahama's ruling. So we're learning something different now about this issue with uh, partial denial and partial admission. So you've got different opinions here. Okay. So you've got this issue with the Rav Chia by Yosef, who had this idea that it's about a loan. And that uh, partial admission, we make the person swear an oath because they could be lying, because it's a delay tactic. But as far as a, a, a partial admission or denial with respect to a deposit, uh, in that in that particular case where the, there's a full denial or a partial denial, we make the person take the uh, oath. But with a loan, if there's a complete denial, we believe it because it's not going to be that brazen. Rav Yochanan doesn't agree, as you know, um, because as far as he was concerned, um, as far as if an article was lost due to uh, a wolf stealing a sheep, for example, uh, we was we were saying about partial admissions, partial denials, etc. Okay, so Rav Chia Bar Abba said in the name of Rav Yochanan, one who is an unpaid custodian and claims a claim of theft. But thief with respect to a deposit has been entrusted to him for safekeeping is not liable to the twofold payment unless he denies part of it and admits to part of it. And the pure reason there is because of the scriptural verse in Shmuel chapter 22, verse 8. Okay, so now we're getting back to this issue of uh, requiring a partial denial and a partial admission. Uh, and that's according to Rami Bachama. Rather said, what's the reason for this ruling by Rav? I mean, Bahama, regarding the unpaid custodian, it's explicitly written in that Pasuk in Exodus chapter 22, verse 8. This is it, meaning that's all our year, I don't know you anything more. And the teachers he's liable to an oath only when he makes a partial admission. Okay. Now, what, what do we actually uh, mean? Uh, is that uh, Rav, Rami Bahama actually understands the verse is referring to even the unpaid custodian. And he rejects Rav here by Yosef's suggestion that there's a mixture of scriptural passages for a loan uh, and, and a custodian. He said, no, it's very, very clear. We're just talking about a custodian. 
and he's liable to an oath only when he makes a partial admission. So paid custodian is likewise liable to an oath if he makes a partial admission. So we're learning a couple of things here. Unpaid custodian, we know that partial admission, partial denial, he has to give an oath. What about a paid custodian? He's liable to an oath only when he makes a partial admission. How do we know this, guys? Is the Gazeera Shava using the term giving, giving. So let me explain to you what a Gazeera Shava is. It's a, it's a case where we extrapolate where there's certain words that are extra in the Pasuk. And uh, Hashem never puts extra words in the Torah unless it's meant, uh, Torah doesn't waste words for an application somewhere else. So when there's a specific set of words, like here there's a Gezeira Shabba with the term uh, um, giving and giving from the passage of the unpaid custodian. So what do we mean? In Exodus chapter 22, verse 6 to 8, it begins with the clause, if a man shall give. And the passage regarding the paid custodian begins, Brendan, identically with the clause, if a man shall give. So that establishes a Gezeira Shava rule, which teaches us to apply the law in the passage of the unpaid uh, custodian, namely that a partial admission is a prerequisite for the custodian's oath to the paid custodian as well. Okay, that's how we learn of the Gezeira Shava. And what's this rule, guys, with the borrower? He's also liable to pay uh, to an oath only when he makes a partial admission. Why? And how do we learn this? Not with the Gezeira Shava. There's the Vav which is um, a follow-on. It says, and if a man shall borrow, uh, borrow from his fellow. That's in uh, chapter 22, verse 13. So there's a conjunction word. It's a vav. Uh, you're learning Hebrew at the moment, which is the word and. So what it says, um, that when you're saying and, and it's carrying on from the previous um, uh, uh, verse, it means it's the following the first topic. The second topic is following the first topic because it's not a separate sentence. It says we're learning this principle about an unpaid custodian and we're learning this about the borrower. Get what I'm saying? Yeah. Correct. So as far as the rent is concerned, guys, according to the one who says the rent is like a paid custodian, we apply the Gezeira Shava from the Pasuk. If you say it's of a paid custodian, we also apply that of the pasuk. So whether the rent is like an unpaid custodian or paid custodian, we learn here that either way, in a borrower, there's this principle of you only have to take an oath if there's a partial admission and a partial denial. Uh, for all of those cases of all those custodians. Okay? So we want to know, does everybody agree with it? Okay. So the Gemara discusses this qualification of an unpaid custodian who maybe Brendan falsely claims that the um, um, theft for, for if he says, no, it was stolen from him, this custodian. So he pays the twofold payment. Why? Because he claims theft and in fact he stole it. So therefore he's treated as a thief. A thief pays twofold. So Rav Chia by Yosef Gaz states, an unpaid custodian who claims a claim of theft by a thief with respect to a deposit that was entrusted to him for safekeeping, when he in fact had stolen it himself, is not liable to the twofold payment unless he misappropriated before he swore. So guys, what do you what do you perceive by the word misappropriated? What do you deem it means? Anybody can guess. Stolen. Uh, yeah, so misappropriated funds, when you're talking about the ANC or the EFS, is known <laughs> as the term stolen. But the actual term in the Chumash means that the person used it for personal use. In other words, if you steal a cow and you put it to work, that's a misappropriation of somebody else's animal. He did work with it, right, according to Rashi. It's different if you just store the animal in your barn. Because at that point, no harm done to the same degree. You haven't used the animal yet. So even if witnesses testify that, that the custodian kept the cow, he's not liable to careful unless he worked the cow for his personal use prior to taking the oath. That's according to one opinion. So the term misappropriation means that the custodian who had been assigned to safeguard the deposit illegally uses it, Kevin. So it's not the same as stealing it. So I'll give you an example. It's like Zuma takes the money out of the EFF and puts it into account. Now, he hasn't spent the money yet. 
So we're saying, do we make sure he pays the double payment or do we make sure he just returns the money? In other words, is keeping it uh, for inverted commas safekeeping uh, as bad as using it in which it no longer exists? So it's not the same as stealing, which means he basically hides the fact that he has it in his possession. So according to Rav Khir by Yosef, he rules in order to be assessed for the kefal, which is the double payment of the penalty, uh, uh, which is equivalent to the principal. The custodian must first misappropriate the deposit by using it and then deny having claimed it, um, claimed that it was stolen from him. In other words, he's kept it in his abode and he's used it. So both factors are needed according to Rav Khir by Yosef. Now, what's the reason? Because it states in the Chumash, the householder, we know the householder means the custodian, shall approach the judges to swear that he did not lay his hand upon his fellow's property. Meaning in Shmuel chapter 22, verse 7, this is verse 7, Brendan. Um, the Gomorrah establishes that the householders, the uh, custodian, shall approach the judge and he has to take a court-imposed oath. And there's three oaths, guys, that he takes. Number one, there's an oath claiming he was not negligent in allowing the deposit to be stolen. Number two, that he did not misappropriate the deposit. In other words, use it illegally when he didn't have permission. And number three, that it's not in his possession. Okay? So that, that implies that if he did lay his hand upon the deposit and misappropriated uh, it, he's liable for the twofold payment. And it serves to tell us that when the verse but proceeds to impose the twofold payment upon the custodian, we're dealing with a case where he initially misappropriated the deposit before sticking it in his property. Because the verse requires, according to that opinion, that the custodian swear, among other oaths, that he didn't misappropriate the deposit. So we learn when the succeeding verse states, whomever the judges find guilty shall pay twofold to his fellow, it means that the careful payment is imposed when the court finds him guilty, in regard to the previous mentioned oath. In other words, witnesses testify not only that he stole the deposit, but also that he misappropriated it and used that item illegally before he stole it. So there's an opinion uh, that the court not, uh, the court doesn't need to find him additionally guilty with respect to the oath, that he was not negligent, because if he stole the item, he wasn't negligent. He, he was a criminal. He didn't let somebody else do it, but he altogether... Believe me, used it for himself. So that's according to Rav Khir by Yosef. Now we've got uh, seven and a half minutes. Don't worry, guys, it's like the dentist. Eventually the time does run out. So you'll be okay. So there's a dissenting opinion. Uh, so Rav Khir by Abba said to, uh, said to them, so said Rav Yochanan, they taught that a custodian is liable to the twofold payment regarding a case where the deposited animal it's still standing by its trough where it was not uh, misappropriated. So we've got two opinions. We've got Rav here by Yosef who said it has to be misappropriated and stolen in order to invoke the careful payment. Rav Yochanan taught that the animal's still standing by the trough. In other words, it wasn't used yet. It was just stolen. So the Gemara wants to say, is it a case according to an exception of the rule. In other words, Rav Zaira says to Rav Chia Ba'aba, does Rav Yochanan mean to say that the twofold penalty applies specifically when the deposited animal is standing by its trough and the custodian did not misappropriate it? But if he misappropriated, he basically acquired it as a robber. And from that moment, he's liable to pay for it in any event. Now, you know that if he's de deemed a robber, uh, he basically only has to return the item, he doesn't have to pay careful, he doesn't have to pay double. So do we say that because he misappropriated it now, he doesn't have to pay careful, he's treated as a robber, not a thief? Or do we say that his subsequent oath that the deposit was stolen is actually completely ineffective because when he discovered uh, by witnesses that he stole it himself, he's not liable to the twofold payment. So all it's saying is that the custodian who misappropriates the deposit is deemed to have acquired it as a robber, since from that point forward he's liable, and this is why he's deemed as a robber, even if it's lost through an unavoidable mishap. In other words, when he made the false oath, we don't trust somebody that makes a false oath and is caught out. 
we don't allow an, uh, a witness to be a robber or any criminal or a pathological liar. So since a robber is in the same category as somebody that committed perjury, from that moment on, if the car that he stole is lost through an unavoidable mishap, he has to pay it back. So the legal acquisition itself doesn't make him liable to careful as a thief, but it makes him liable just to pay the cash equivalent if that animal goes missing. Because in essence, he's denying liability for his own object that he, uh, he took. So that's one reason to exempt the uh, custodian turned robber from the careful. And that's why the Gomorrah says, if he misappropriated, he acquired it. And the subsequent oath is, is completely ineffective because if he acquired it and became a robber, whatever he says at that point, it's his. He only has to, he's not careful because the minute he lied, he's treated as a robber and therefore he has to just pay it back. So the question was, is it an exception or is it the rule? What do we mean? Is that um, does Rav Zayu say to Rav Kriya Ba'aba that Rav Yochanan meant to say that the twofold penalty applies specifically when the deposited animal is standing by its trough and the custodian did not misappropriate it. But if he misappropriated, he required it as a robber. And from that moment on, he's liable to pay for it in any event, but there's no careful. And his subsequent oath that the deposit was stolen is completely ineffective for him. So when he's discovered to have stolen himself, he's not liable to the twofold payment because he's a perjurer and therefore he's treated as a robber, he just returns that value. Or perhaps Rav Yochanan means to say that the twofold payment applies even when the deposited animal is standing by its trough and was not appropriated, but it certainly applies when the custodian did misappropriate. In other words, one opinion states if he misappropriated it, according to Rav Yochanan, he becomes a robber and only has to return the value or the animal itself. The other opinion is that whether he misappropriated it or not, he has to pay the twofold payment. And even if uh, he he did misappropriate it, he still is treated uh, uh, like a thief and has to pay double. And if he didn't, he's treated as a thief. So we want to say, is it the exception or is it the rule? Now, Rav Chia Ba'aba replies to Rav Zayla, to Rav Zayla, I didn't hear anything about this from Rav Yochanan. There's a similar case, though. Rav Asi said in the name of Rav Yochanan, if an unpaid custodian claims a claim of loss, uh, meaning that uh, a wolf stole the sheep regarding a deposit that had been entrusted to him and swears to this effect, and then later guys, he changes his mind, he retracts the claim and says that a person stole it from him and he swears to that effect. And witnesses come and testify that he himself stole it. He's exempt from the twofold payment. Now, there's two possible reasons for it, according to Rav Yochanan. We've got two and a half minutes. It's important. Is it not because he acquired the deposit as a robber with the first oath? In, in other words, the minute he perjured himself, he became like a robber, and therefore he only has to return the value of the item because a, a robber and a perjurer is treated the same as a criminal. And therefore they only have to uh, return the value that they robbed. We see that Rav Yochanan holds that once a custodian acquires a deposit as a robber, the subsequent false oath is irrelevant. At that point, he's a perjurer, he's a criminal, and it doesn't lie, render him liable to the twofold payment, whether he misappropriated or not. Or, uh, or does it? So Rav, Yochan, Rav Zainu rejects the proof, um, and he said to Rav Chia Ba'aba, no, Rav Yochanan's reason for exempting the custodian in the case is because he acquired the deposit through his first oath. Um, it's not that. It's that because he discharged his obligation with the first oath. So what did we learn, guys? We learned a case, according to Rav Yochanan, that if somebody claims it was lost and denies emphatically that he was responsible and witnesses against came against him and said he stole it, He's responsible in Shemaim, but his oath has to be believed by the plaintiff, and therefore he doesn't have to pay the careful payment. And it's on that basis that he's off the uh, the hook, because he claims it was a loss through an accident, and not that it was stolen from him from a human. But it seems to imply that this case, Rav Zaira is saying that he still has to pay back the principal, he just doesn't have to pay back double. 
Whereas when we learned this opinion of Rav Yochanan before, we learned that it exempts uh, the custodian uh, entirely when it was a case of it being uh, lost. I don't know. I don't know if you remember that, guys. Guys, do you remember that? All right. Uh, I think it's uh, you guys are all uh, a little sleepy. Uh, I wish you a, a good work and